Welcome again, everyone. As we begin, this is our first session of uh, six sessions on spiritual warfare. So today is kind of the overarching, just an introduction to the topic. So we'll begin with a prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us to have our minds fixed on God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, we'll just begin by um, kind of throwing out there, I wonder what you think of when you hear about spiritual warfare. If you knew what the topic was going to be, uh, when you hear spiritual warfare, what springs to mind for you? It's different things for different people. Uh, do you think about maybe discouragement or temptation? Or maybe do you think about like the devil or the demonic and maybe like really supernatural phenomena? Uh, I think that what you'll find over the course of these um, sessions is that it involves all of those things, uh, but yet it's something far more challenging and bigger uh, and actually more important for all of us. So maybe just begin by just a, a definition. What is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is the organized campaign where we join God in the battle against the enemies, both within and outside of ourselves, the enemies that would keep us from our goal of being united with God. I'll say that one more time. Spiritual warfare is the organized campaign where we join God in the battle against the enemies within ourselves and also outside of ourselves, the enemies that would keep us from our goal of being united with God. I saw a talk uh, recently enough and uh, the priest in the talk was, um, he, he, was drawing some, he was drawing out some points and he said, there are four ways that you can lose a fight. <laughs> and then he gave four really great points that I'm going to just mention to you now as, uh, as just as, as an introduction. He said, there's four ways to lose a fight. The first way is not to realize that you're in a fight. The second way is confusing your enemies with your friends. The third way is not using the weapons that you have at your disposal. And the fourth is not realizing that you have something worth fighting for. I thought that was very good and very insightful, right? So I'm just going to look at each of those four points as we begin. So first, one way to lose a fight is not realizing that you're in a fight in the first place. Uh, I'd say that most people are pretty oblivious, even people within the church people who are practicing their faith, even going to mass on Sundays. I'd say that a lot of people are very oblivious of the spiritual enemies that we have lined up against us that again are looking to uh, stop us from that goal that we have of being united with God. We mightn't like that we have enemies. I don't think many people would like rejoice at that fact. I don't think that's like good news for people. Um, we mightn't like that we have enemies or that we have a fight to be fought. We might wish that it was different, but it isn't. And we do. <laughs> so we've got to like square up to those truths, those facts, um, or else we're definitely going to lose. We don't know that we're in a fight or if we're, we can't kind of like um, muster up the, the energy and the, the sort of determination to actually like enter into it, then we're, we're, we're beat before we even, like, before we even take the pitch. Okay, so the second way to lose a fight, he said, is to confuse your enemies with your friends. You've got to know who your enemy is. Who is it that you're fighting against? You've got to know who your allies are, who your friends are. God and humanity have enemies. Now, from the scripture and from our tradition, it's within scripture, <clears throat> kind of... Uh, maybe in a more veiled way, 
but it's clearly it's uh, much more clearly drawn out by the saints let's say as the centuries pass the enemies of god and also of humanity there are three that again our tradition really identifies for us first is the flesh the second is the world and the third is the devil now, during these sessions, what we're going to do is we're going to devote at least one class, one of these sessions, to each of those enemies, right? And I say at least one class because the flesh uh, is a little bit more involved, actually. And so we're actually going to have three sections about that, but more on that later, okay? The third way to lose a fight is not to use the weapons that are at your disposal, Learning more about this fight and the weapons God, God gives us, the sort of tools that we have to engage in this fight against the enemies of God and our enemy, um, our enemies, uh, that's going to be a substantial part of like these sessions. So I won't kind of anticipate that and, and um, yeah, like uh, get into it too much. That, that's going to come. That's going to be like the uh, big chunk of what we're doing. So we'll leave that for them. The fourth point, the fourth way that we can lose a fight is not knowing that we have something worth fighting for. We have something so worth fighting for. We have someone so worth fighting for. We're fighting with Christ and we're fighting to be united with him. He is the one who made us and the one that we are made to enjoy union with him. He is the treasure buried in the field. He is the pearl of great price. He is the one who holds us in existence. He is the one who liberates and heals us. He calms our storms. He is the living water that we thirst for. He is our very life in the Eucharist and our hope, the reason that we hope, for have hope for eternity. He is the God who has come to us as husband to lift his people and to share his life with them and his glory. What can we compare with him? What's not worth sacrificing for him? How could we not be totally rooted or totally committed to rooting out anything that's going to stop us from being united with him. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, I, uh, I'm going to just change things up slightly. We talk about spiritual warfare. All right. So the first page of my notes, no problem. This is page two and page three. <laughs> They're all blank. I don't know what happened to them. Anyway, I still have my notes. They're just on my computer. So I'll, uh, I'll just make an adjustment here. Okay. So, um, just want to make sure. Can you all hear me still? Are we all good? Great. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. So the topics, uh, now that we're going to be facing. Well, first of all, before we get to the topics, I just want to underline this. Sometimes we can, uh, we can get caught up in, you know, the fact that we have enemies and in the details of what this fight is going to consist of and, and things like that. And we can lose the um, very reason that we're in this fight. This is really important, the fourth point, knowing that we have something worth fighting for. We're fighting with Christ and we're also fighting for him. We're fighting for union with him. Um, the only way that spiritual warfare makes sense is in the context of uh, our growing in the love of God. That's what, that's what it's all about. It's growing in the love of God. And just the simple recognition that we have, there are forces, enemies that are working to, uh, I don't know, thwart our growth in the love of God. Okay. So the topics of these, of these talks now, we're just going to look uh, at that. I want to tell you about the structure that we're going to be, we're going to be taking. 
what we're going to do is we're going to base those base them around again the three enemies that we face that scripture and tradition tells us about that are working to um, prevent us from growing in union with God and love of God. So the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now the devil is probably the most obvious one and uh, we'll cover that and the world as well. Um, but the flesh is something that's uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit less obvious, maybe we should say. Uh, what does scripture and what does tradition mean by the flesh? So sometimes scripture uses it in different ways, uses that term, the flesh, in different ways. So the first way, one of the ways that it can use the flesh is uh, positively. So for instance, um, like when it describes how the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, or how God created man and woman whom God designed to come together to become one flesh. And then by, by doing that, to come together as one flesh to share in his work of creation. Or another time where the flesh is used in this really positive sense is that Jesus communicates eternal life through what? Through his flesh that we receive in the Eucharist and that we eat. So the flesh is used often in scripture in a positive way. Um, and it means in that case, humanity basically, and our human nature. So we receive the sacred humanity of Christ in the Eucharist. Our, hum our humanity, our human nature is such that God created us male and female. And by coming together as God intended, uh, we join him in his work of creation, actually. And then the incarnation, God himself took on our human nature. He became one of us and joined us in a truly human life. So the flesh, positively, in the scriptures, in the Bible, means just human nature. But sometimes the scripture and the tradition describes the flesh in negative terms as well. And in this sense, it also means our human nature, but it focuses in a special way on the fact that our human nature is fallen. Our human nature is fallen. So if you go to the catechism, starting in paragraph 374, the catechism describes how man was created as a creature with both body and soul, and that because of that, there's always been a tension within human beings. Because we're made both body and soul, the body is kind of drawn in one direction while the soul is drawn towards other things, right? But before the fall, that tension that existed between this body and soul that humanity was given, was endowed with, um, it was like a, a beautiful tension. I've heard it described once as like the tension that, uh, that exists when a string is pulled nice and taut and the sort of like the music that can come from that, right? You think of like a guitar, stringing guitar or a violin. What happened in the fall? What happened in the fall was the kind of disintegration, the falling apart of that um, harmony, of that integrity. Again, that tension that existed between our soul and our body was always there, but in the fall, it just all kind of fell apart. We experienced a like disintegration, like a brokenness, right? Uh, now, What's our experience of that? Our experience is that we have certain drives, right? And we're going to talk about what those are uh, in later classes when we talk about the flesh, right? We have different drives and we have different passions that are so strong and so overwhelming sometimes that they pull us and they, they really kind of are in the driver's seat of our actions. And then we have like our higher, what are called our higher faculties. In other words, like our, our more the kind of spiritual uh, parts of our soul, like our intellect and our will, our intellect is has been dimmed. So we don't know God like Adam and Eve knew God in the beginning. Uh, we don't recognize, know his will as good. 
like they did. And then as far as our will is concerned, my gosh, I mean, like how weak willed can we be sometimes, you know? Um, were you good today, by the way, on, uh, on Ash Wednesday? Did you <laughs> resist <laughs> the temptations, you know, pull back from the table, pull back from the chocolate or whatever it is that you're, that you're doing. But you can see this um, kind of disintegration, basically, like we're, we're divided in ourselves. We're pulled this way and that. And the very things that should be sort of helping us to be masters of ourselves, kind of in control, like our intellect and our will, um, not suppressing our drives or passions, but just kind of holding them in a reasonable, so that we, we live them in a reasonable way. Uh, those are those have been weakened and our drives and our passions again can often be in the driver's seat so we have this disintegration this unity disunity rather within us okay our human nature is fallen to say a word right now when we live oblivious to that fact that our human natures are fallen we are seriously deluded we're deluded we, those of us who have maybe come back to God, having wandered away, know what this is like. We lived pursuing different goals, some of which were good and some of which were bad. But we were oblivious to the overarching goal of our lives, which again is union with God, to grow in love, loving union with God. We were unaware that there were things that were separating us from God and things that were actually kind of thwarting our, um, our progress towards that, that ultimate goal of our lives. We were unaware that because we weren't being influenced and directed by God, we were being influenced and directed by all sorts of other things. Sometimes we think that we are, uh, kind of freely and independently making our decisions, but uh, often we're, we're operating under the influence of maybe people or forces or um, influences that we mightn't be aware of even. I, I remember a monk uh, saying to me once, he was talking about the vow of obedience. And he said, there's one thing you have to realize. He said, everyone obeys someone. The question he said is, who are you listening to? Who is it that you're obeying? If we're not obeying God, if we're not listening to God, if he's not influencing our lives, if we're not kind of living, you could say, under the lordship of Jesus, then we're being influenced and directed and driven and inspired by something else. And those things are, in fact, our enemies. <laughs> They're not bringing us where we want to go. We're operating under the influence then of our fallen nature or of the world or of the devil, right? Some combination of, of all of those things. Now, the very strong term that the Bible uses to describe um, humanity in this state is that we were once enemies of God. Enemies of God. It's a very strong way to describe it, and yet it's scripture. There are plenty of baptized people who were once in their baptism reconciled with God, right? God brought them close to himself, but who are still living their lives like he doesn't exist or uh, who are working at cross purposes with him, like they were in some way enemies. Now, when we talk about people being enemies of God, it's really important that we kind of um, think clearly about this, right? Does God regard them as enemies to fight against? Hardly. Not at all. God loves them and actually goes after them. In fact, St. Paul really beautifully describes it like this. He said, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. God, our father, loves those who are far from him. And that's what he commanded us to do, didn't he? To love those who were, who had pitted themselves against us as enemies. That's the way that God loves. 
God loved us, but we didn't love him. Again, those of us who have lived away from God know this. We know what it's like to, in fact, resent God. In many ways, we were like, and many people are still like, kind of spoiled and rebellious children, you know, or like stupid sheep. We don't want to live under God's reign. We don't want the life that he wants for us. We wanted to be free from him. And we pursued happiness as we saw fit. And we wandered away from him. What we didn't know is that we could wander away from the green fields that feed us and we could actually starve. We could ourselves be hurt. And we didn't know that out there, there are wolves. But God is good. He is so good. And again, those of us who maybe have been far away and have been brought back like the little lamb, you know, on the shoulders of the good shepherd. We know that God goes out in search of the lost one. He leaves the 99 and he goes in search of the one. God brings us back. God doesn't just bring us back though, right? God is described many times in the scriptures as a warrior. You probably heard it described, God described as the Lord of hosts. Hosts means armies. He fights for us so that we can be united with him. And he teaches us how to fight with him ourselves. He wants us to be warriors too. He wants us to be like the boy, David, to stand up to the enemies of God and humanity with the full strength of God at our back. Do you remember David? He was a boy. He was young. He was too small even to, to fit into the, the armor of Saul. And down he goes to confront and do battle with the giant. There are giants out there, people. And we're going to learn from the scriptures during these sessions and from the church's tradition and from the saints what those giants are like the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're going to learn how they undermine the goal of our union with God. And we're also going to learn about what weapons God has given us to fight them. So like I mentioned to you before, we're going to divide the sessions up into uh, a looking at each of those three kind of uh, those enemies of humanity and God. So the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, the world and the devil are fairly straightforward. By the world, what do we mean? We mean the total number of people in the world who oppose Jesus Christ. Now, don't just think of, of like individuals, right? But think about like all of those who oppose Jesus Christ because they don't know him or don't love him. But think about them kind of together as, as making up maybe institutions and shaping cultures. Different sort of um, realities that we encounter and experience that are hostile to Christ and hostile to the gospel. That's by what we mean by the world, right? The atmosphere we live in, the air that we breathe, it's kind of everywhere, you know? But it's, it seriously undermines faith and it, undermine, it undermines like our commitment to God and this, you know, the goal that we have of union with him. We'll talk more about that, but the world, particularly now and in this country, is very strong. It's very strong. The second enemy is, that's quite straightforward is the devil, right? Uh, by the devil, what do we mean? We mean Satan the greatest of the fallen angels who was created good by God, 
but who fell because of his refusal to honor, love, and serve God. And obviously his, uh, the angels who, who fell with them, whom we call demons, right? And then the last is the flesh, right? Which we kind of, you know, hinted at there anyway. Um, now, the flesh is, is, has been understood. This is quite explicit in scripture. Um, St. John in his first letter. So first John chapter two, verse 16, uh, St. John describes the flesh as being a three part or like a threefold concupiscence. In other words, our fallen humanity is broken in three ways. Okay. The first way is what he calls the pride of life. The second is the lust of the eyes. And the third is the lust of the flesh. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the next five sessions, right? And we're going to look at each of those. So the next session, what we're going to look at is what's called the pride of life. This is under the heading, let's say, of the flesh. In other words, our fallen humanity. Then uh, we're going to look at in the third session, the lust of the eyes, right? Which is like our immoderate love of goods and possessions and the ways that that can kind of affect us and how to fight against it. That's what we're going to do in the third session. Then we're going to look at the lust of the flesh in the fourth session. This is like the immoderate love that we can have, we can be affected by for sensual pleasures. So like of sex and food and drink and how these things can affect us. And again, how we fight against them. That's the three, those are the three sessions that we're going to have on our fallen human nature, how we can be fallen, how that thwarts our goal of union with God and how we actually fight against those things in order to go grow closer to God. Then in our fifth session, we're going to look at the world. And in our sixth session, we're going to look at the devil and how he influences us, what sort of, uh, what role impact he actually has in human experience, human life, and then how we uh, we can resist, fight, and best the devil. Okay? So that is the plan. Lovely stuff. Excellent. Well, uh, again, next week we're going to come back and we're going to look at the first way in which our human nature is fallen, uh, the pride of life. This is the most important way. Sometimes when we think about, like, you know, temptation and the ways that we're kind of, uh, um, you know, the, the, the ways that we can be uh, unhelpfully like affected by sin. Sometimes we go first to um, like the, the sensual kind of stuff, you know, towards maybe sex or, um, you know, towards like uh, drinking and things like that. Um, actually, the, the much more substantial thing would be the pride of life. So that's what we're going to look at the, the, the next time. Um, and then again, some helpful tips, hopefully, well, no, there's helpful tips from the saints and from the tradition of the church as to how we can fight those things in order to grow closer to God. So that'll be next week. Um, we might just finish with a prayer in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. So we pray glory be to the father and to the son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.